Hi, everybody. Um, if we're ready to begin, are we ready to begin? Man at the back. <clears throat> All good, okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Dave Gunnell. I work for Underscore Scala Consultancy, and I'm here to talk to you about functional data validation. Um, before I begin, I want to apologize for the quality of my voice. I picked up a bug from, uh, from the office last week, so uh, unfortunately it's, it's nothing exciting like you know, too many fine beers and uh, uh, late nights at, uh, at Scala Days, but it's something more, more mundane than that. Better now, but you'll have to just bear with me, and I, ho I hope my voice lasts for the session. Um, so I want to talk to you about data validation. Actually, I want to talk to you about functional programming. Um, this is a beginner level talk uh, aimed at people who are new to Scala or uh, maybe even experienced programmers but are programming in Scala or in, their, in functional programming languages for the first time. Um, and it's aimed to get past what I think is one of the major roadblocks for new Scala developers which is this functional mindset. There's lots of libraries we use that are written in a functional style. We hear the word monad banded around like it's you know, bread or <laughs> something really dreadfully common, um, and um, we have to write code in a, in a manner that's sympathetic to those libraries as well. Okay, so data validation is a great uh, topic to talk about this. First of all, because everybody knows it. Okay, so hands up if you've validated something before. Web, app, web form, something like this. Yes, I, we know we're on the same ground here, right? Uh, but also, this is a great functional programming topic. Uh, validating data is all about taking it to pieces, looking at parts of it, transforming them into new types and, 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 and this kind of stuff. And that's functional programming. That's what it's all about. So this is a, a very deep rabbit hole where, where we, we can sort of uh, go down and find all these wonderful uh, uh, functional um, abstractions. Um, what I want to talk to you about is just the simple stuff that you can do within weeks of starting Scala. So to me, the essence of functional programming is simply this. You break a problem down into the smallest, most abstract components, and then you find combinators to build them up to make complex behaviors. And that's it. That's all we're going to talk about. So hands up, um, anyone who, um, how can we divide this, who's uh, been programming Scala for less than six months? Because there's a few hands in the audience. And so I take it there's a bunch of people with lots of experience here. There's a bunch of people with little experience here. If you're getting started, this might be a really great walkthrough of a problem. If you're more experienced, then maybe take this to work with someone who's less experienced. It's a really great uh, problem you can walk through with new Scala developers to kind of show off how to think in this way. What I'm not going to do is make a great fuss about capital M functional programming words, or capital letter functional programming words, of which the most uh, common one is monad. We don't we do need to know these terms as, as, as functional programmers. I think they're important, but we don't need to know them to get started, and that's what this is about. So, what I'm going to do, I'm going to run through three different sprints, uh, each one tackling a different complexity of problem, and hopefully each sprint leading into the next. Uh, for those of you who've seen my Scala Exchange talk last year, which had the same title, this has actually got different content, so we've got different sprints in here, so uh, I'll reach a point where I can actually you know, promote my previous talk. So, we're a new programmer, we turn up uh, at a, a company and we, we, we arrive on day one, and we get into our first sprint, and the product owner says to us, hey, we're building you know, this new great address book app, uh, we've got all these address objects lying around, and we need to validate them, so I want you to write the code for that. Um, so we have classic little case class, a uh, house number and a street name. Um, and we need to validate certain things in that case class that we don't already have represented in the type system. So we know that the house number is an integer. This is, this is good. We've got this covered. But in the type system, we don't have some other things uh, represented that we might want to have. So for example, we don't have any proof here that the house number is, uh, is one or more. And we don't have any proof that the, the street name is not an empty string. And for these things, we might want to do runtime validation. So we build a function which will validate that data structure. Um, the other key goal of validation, lest I forget, is that we're interested in getting all of the errors out. So we don't want to have a, a, an address where both the 
the, the, the house number is minus one and the street is a blank string and get one of those errors back, fix that bug and then get another error back. This is not what we want. We want everything all at once as much as possible. So being a, a budding young uh, a developer, we get cracking, we, we know a bit of Scala, we start writing code and we immediately sort of churn out some stuff like this. So what have we got? Well, we know we need to validate data. We know we need to validate more stuff than uh, just, um, just an address. So we build a generic type, a validator that will validate things of type A. And we know we're going to need to have more than one rule. So we have a little rule which is, you know, has a Boolean test and an error message and all this kind of stuff. Now, before we, you know, who took a photo without the cross on it? You take another, <laughs> they take another one with the cross on it. This is the wrong approach. This is not the functional uh, approach to this. We're tying ourselves into an implementation here by making too many choices up front. Remember, functional programming is about boiling things down to the simplest layer and building them back up. And here, we're, we're stuck with things like this error message. What if we want an error message that takes the value that was wrong into account? You know, minus one is not a good house number. We can't do that because we've broken the model. What, it, what about this list of rules up the top? What's the semantics there? Presumably there's a conjunction of rules, we have to check them all, but is it fail fast? Do we check every one? Is it, is it a disjunction where only one rule must pass at a time? And before we know it, we'll have disjunctive validator and conjunctive fail fast validator, and we've got a Java library. So we want to avoid that. So uh, there's really only one thing we need uh, to validate uh, a, a, a data structure, and that's just a function. So if we really boil this down, the only type we, well, there's two types we need, and this is one of them. The only type of thing we really need is uh, a function that takes in a, a, a value of type A and returns a result. OK, what's a result? There are a few different questions we can ask about this. The main one is, what is this result? And then we can ask all these other questions, like how do we get back to having multiple rules in play, and how do we have rules that take multiple inputs. So we'll explore these things as we go through this talk. But this is really the fundamentals of what we need. So let's look at this result. Uh, also, as a, as, as a, a budding post-university graduate programmer, we know about uh, turning English descriptions into software specifications. So we take this description like this, we turn all the nouns into classes, and we turn all the verbs into methods, and then we should have a, a description of what we need. So, a result is a success or a failure. A success is, says everything is OK. A failure so it contains some error messages. Uh, we can turn that into a Scala definition very easily. By the way, did anyone see uh, my colleague Noel Welsh's talk uh, yesterday? Was it yesterday? It was yesterday. Anyone see that? Hands up if you did. Uh, so what is this? It's an algebraic data type, right? Good. So you know what that means. Forget that. It means we don't have to think too much about writing the code, okay? We can turn it into Scala without even considering too much what we're writing. So a result is a pass or a fail. A fail contains a list of error messages, and we're done, okay? So between that and the definition of a rule, which is something that returns that, we can now build validation rules. So let's have a look. Let's, let's consider the street name first. So we can define rules like this. Is a string not empty? It's just a function that takes in a string and fails if it's empty and, and uh, passes if it's not. Uh, for the house number, we have a slightly more complicated case. We want to make sure the house number is greater than or equal to one. Um, so it makes sense to build a rule that's sort of greater than or equal to. Now that has two inputs, right? The house number and one. So we can represent that trivially by a slightly, uh, a slightly higher order function. So this is a, a function that takes in a minimum value and returns a rule to check whether something is greater than or equal to that minimum value. So we can do simple things like this to build more complicated rules from our basic data types. Everyone with me so far? All good? Excellent. Um, OK, so we're nearly there now. We've got, um, we've got a, a rule to check our house number. We've got a rule to check our street name. And now we can combine them. Um, let's see what that looks like. We start off with an address, we split it into two different fields and run it through these two different rules and then we are, they either fail independently or we get a pass back. So what we need now is a way of combining those into a single rule that looks something like this, where we either get 
we get one or more of these error messages or we get a pass. So we need to build a combinator to do that, a, a, a function that will enable us to combine results. And that's fairly simple. Uh, oh, I'll just write it out and we can dissect it. So check address is a rule that takes in an address, passes the number to GTE, passes the street to non empty, and then combines them together. So the one last piece we need for this sprint before we ship our code is this oh, oh, unit test as well, obviously, uh, is to define and. So that's a method that looks like this. We're anding two results together. And remember, we want to accumulate, uh, we want to accumulate all the error messages. So um, we need to implement and on a result. And let's do that right now. Now, a result is an algebraic data type. So anyone who went to Noel's talk will know that now we need to write some. <laughs> no, Noel, you can't call the, <laughs> call the answer out yourself. Uh, structural recursion. Pattern matching is what we like to do. So before we even think about it, we go, we're trying to combine this result and that result. So let's pattern match on this result and decide what to do. Well, now I've pattern matched on this result, I'll pattern match on that result. Okay, great. Uh, I've got four possible cases here, and we just fill in the blanks, right? So the most important part is this part at the bottom. If both of the rules fail, we accumulate all the error messages. If they both pass, we pass, and otherwise we just pass the, the error messages through. Okay, so we have a definition for and, we have a definition for check address, we can validate existing addresses, and you know we've done it without any... There's no frameworks involved in this. There's no library code. We've just written it. It's super trivial. That's the end of our sprint. We can now ship. So we've seen that um, just by using simple building blocks like a function and a little algebraic data type, so just a sealed trait and uh, just a simple couple of classes, we have the basis for a library. And everything else is built by defining higher level abstractions, so functions that return functions or uh, methods that will combine results in various ways. Uh, and of course, we've done our algebraic data type structural recursion uh, homework from yesterday, so, so this is all good. Okay, let's move on. In week two, or week three, sprint two at any rate, the product owner says, okay, that's great. We can now validate our existing address stuff, but what we really want to do is we want to get web scale. So we've got a web form that lets people type in the shipping address, and we need to validate this now. Um, and as functional programmers, we know that validation is just transformations on data. So why don't we do the turning of the web form data into an address at the same time as we do the validation? So we have this green arrow here representing a transformation. It might fail. It might pass. We can do all of this stuff in one go. We already have validation rules for the stuff we previously checked, um, so we can ignore those. But now we need to deal with some new stuff. Um, form data here, uh, you know, we've all done some kind of web development. It's probably a map of string to string or a map of string to sequence of string or something like this. So there's no typing in there at all. And we need to make sure that all the fields are present and then, you know, the, the house number can be parsed into an integer and all of this stuff. So let's have a look at that. We've got another little flowchart here. By the way, I apologize. I know these are quite small for the people at the back, but I'll, you know, I'll, I'll talk you through it. So hopefully it's not too big of a problem. So the, uh, we start with some form data on the left. Again, we split it into two fields. Um, I'm going to uh, not define this get number and parse int. We imagine we've defined these validation rules already. They're, they're pretty easy to define. But we've got these, these are all boxes are all rules here. So we try to get the house number out. Then we try to convert it to an integer. And then, well, this one's not a rule. This is the constructor for an address. So we have these two different pathways. Now, the bit that we haven't done yet is, is that bit, the, 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 the sequencing of uh, extracting the house number and then trying to turn it into an integer. So we want to take these two steps and combine them into a single step again. Uh, so here we're going to fail with some of these error messages or, or pass if both of these rules pass. So let's try and write that code. We'll try and write read, read number, the uh, combined uh, 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 validation rule for parsing the number and, and, and getting it as an integer. So here it is. It's a rule that takes in some form data. We start by uh, trying to get the uh, string value of the field, and then we try to uh, get an integer. We check that it's an integer, and then eventually we return the result. And of course, the problem is 
we don't have any way of linking these two rules together. All the rules do at the moment is check whether a property holds. Is, is the house number in the, in the web form data? It doesn't then tell us what the house number was so that we can see if it's a valid, a valid string at the end, okay? So what we're going to do now is, is do a bit of um, quick refactoring. We need a mechanism of passing a value from rule to rule so that we can, uh, so we can take that string house number, send it over to pass in, and say, here's the thing you need to pass. So to do that, let's go back to our, this is our model of validation at the moment. We've got the, 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 the rule at the top and then the result type. We're trying to add some success value to our pass so that we can send that data on. And in order to do that, we'll need to add a type parameter to result so we know what type of result we've got so that we now can express a rule as being something that takes in a value of type A, does some validation, and then hopefully gives you back a B. Uh, so we can actually do transformations now. We can actually transform from string to int or from form data to string. So if we go back to read, read number now, you can see that I've filled in all the types. There's a rule from form data to int, and we have results of string and int here. And now I need a way of just getting that, uh, getting that string out of the first result and plugging it into parse int. It's not, it's, it's not a string, it's a result of string, so we have to get the string out. So in order to inspect the stuff that's in an algebraic data type, we're going to use structural recursion again. It's very simple, pattern matching. And if we, success, if we succeed, we call pass in, and if we fail, we keep on failing. So this is, this is hopefully pretty straightforward. Um, if we wanted to build a big chain of these rules, uh, let's say we had 10 rules all in succession, we'd have to write a lot of code here. We have, for every subsequent rule, we've got four lines of pattern matching and a variable definition and all of this. So we'd ideally like to reduce this somewhat. So what I'd like to do is factor this out. So I've got a nice little method on result that does that pattern matching for me. Can anyone suggest a name for that method? OK. Uh, flat map's correct. Map's not quite correct, but we're getting there. Um, is flat map. So look at the definition there. Um, we have a result of A, and we have a rule, which is a function from an A to a result of B. It's flat map. It's, it's, it's what we know from option. Um, and we just implement the pattern matching here. This is exactly the same code we did on the other slide. And now we have a general combinator for stringing two rules together. So now our read number looks like this. We take the form data, we get the string out, we take the result of the string and plug it into parsint, and at the end we get the integer back, um, and we return that um, to the, uh, the person who called the validation rule. So... Um, if we went a bit further and implemented a map method as well, which we won't do, it's exercise for, 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 for home, we could, of course, express that as a full comprehension. And this is really nice. You know, it's a, a nice syntax to come out with at the end of the exercise. We can string rules together in sequence just using full comprehensions, and it's really satisfying. Now, uh, some of you may be realizing that uh, flat mapping throws away errors, right? If we go back to the definition of flat map, uh, if we fail the first, the first rule fails, we keep on failing. We don't check the second rule. That's fine in this case, because uh, in order to parse an integer, you need a string. If you haven't got that string, you can't parse the thing. So you only ever get one result out of this in any case, or one error message out of this in any case. So this is fine. Flat map throws away errors. We have our AND method to uh, preserve errors, and we have two different ways of combining rules. Okay. By the way, we've just invented a monad here in the middle of the talk, so we don't need to know these terms to start programming. Things like monads just fall out by just, by just you know, naturally thinking about the problem in the right way, of course. Um, so we've got our read number rule. Let's plug it back into the original thing, the original uh, 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 flow chart. So we start with form data, separate up two fields. One goes to read number. One goes to extracting the, the house, uh, the street name. And then we want to combine the results back together. So um, what we'd like is a way of converting this flowchart into a single step. This is another combinator. Uh, so we can do both of these steps, and then we can call address on apply, and then we're going to get out either some, of, some combination of error messages or a successful address at, at, at the end there. Now this, 
uh, is, in, in case anyone was in, in any doubt, this is our AND combinator that we saw earlier. But because we've redefined our results and we put values in there, we'll have to redefine AND. Okay, so let's do that. That was our definition of AND previously. Yeah. Two passes goes to a pass, two fails goes to a big failure, and a pass and a fail goes to a fail. Um, now we've got uh, different uh, types on there. We have start with the result of A, we're ending it with the result of B. Uh, in that address case, we're starting with an integer and a string, and we're getting out an address. So there's also a type uh, C that we're trying to return. And the only problem here is we have no way of, of, of combining an A and a B to produce a C. So all we're going to do is just pass that in as a second parameter. Okay, so we uh, take the two results. Uh, they yield values of A and B. We pass in a function that will take those A and Bs and give us back, in our case, an address. And then that gives us a working, working definition of this. Um, so when we look at our final uh, read address rule, uh, we just extract those two results, pass them into AND, and we have a complete solution. So we can now validate existing addresses, we can validate new addresses, and we're good. So what have we done? We have, I need to stop this doing this, whatever it's doing. Oh, I know what's happening, hang on. It's annoying me, so it must be annoying you. Is that better? That's a bit better, okay, we'll go with that. Um, so rules are now pipelines, and they're pipelines that can transform values, they can change the types of them, we can connect them together into arbitrary flow charts. So that's really great. Um, and we've now seen three different combinators. We've seen AND, we've seen MAP, and we've seen flat map, and they're all useful in their own ways. And we've seen that some of these combinators throw away error messages, we're happy with that, we just choose the right tool for the job. Okay, so we're now just over halfway through. Uh, in the Scala Exchange version of this talk, I went through some stuff about lifting operations so that we can combine rules directly rather than combining the results. Um, I do have some slides for that. What I'll do is I'll get to the end, and if we have time, I'll, I'll just show you how that works. Um, and if we're getting too close, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just take questions and finish, and you can watch the video from the other conference. What I didn't do in Scala Exchange is go through how we generalize over arity. Okay, so um, imagine that our product owner comes back to us in sprint three or four and says, well, we, you know those two fields we've been collecting? It turns out that without a postcode, we can't really find out where the person lives. So can we add that as well? Oh, zip code. Um, so this is fine, except for the fact that our definition of AND we've got at the bottom here only works on two, two values. So... Okay, well, a simple solution is let's just overload it. Let's just make a version of AND that works with three values, right? And we could do that. That's what it would look like. We just have an overloaded method. It's just, just the same as normal. And then, of course, the product owner will come back and say, hey, hey, we need to store, I don't know, the city, something else that's crucially important, and we'll have to have that. And then we'll go to five values, and then we'll go to six values, and we'll go on like this, and presumably we'll go to 22 values, and then we'll... Uh, and then we'll run out, of, run out of numbers. Because everyone knows there's not, there's not more than 22 things in any type ever, right? <laughs> um, and we can do that. And you know, you'll see, if you look through various libraries, you'll see things where there are 22 copies of things stamped out in there, or you've, there's your code generator used to produce this. Um, of course, we don't want to write that code ourselves. So what we might do is use an existing um, functional tool. So, if we were to pull in Scala Z, we'd use something called an applicative functor. We'd define a, 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 a new combinator for combining, um, for, 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 for tra transforming our results in a new way, a bit like map and flat map. Um, and then we would use a, a thing called an applicative builder, which would then use that method to combine our results. I'm not going to talk about that, uh, but it, there is some stuff. I'll show you a link to the GitHub for this um, talk at the end. You, I've worked through it all with comments in some Scala codes. You can see how applicative functions can be used to generalize across arity. Um, there's another technique, which is the sort of... We, we, the idea is to recursively combine results to produce a recursive data structure. So this is sort of a bit like hlists, if you've, if you've heard the term hlists before. I'm not going to use hlists. I'm going to use something slightly... Um, slightly quirkier, but something that I think has, has quite a nice fit with Scala, and it's quite simple and easy to understand. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a new data type called tilde. Um, well, this is just a tuple too, right? This is just a pair of values. So why have I defined a new data type and why have I called it tilde? Well, there's some syntax stuff we can do with uh, Scala that you may or may not know about that means that having a nice short symbolic name for this thing produces some nice, nice DSLs. So here's what we do. Um, if you define a, a data type called something like tilde, you can, it's just a case class, so I can build an instance of it, right? Tilde of 29 Acacia Road. Whose address is that? Banana Man's. Just remember that. Um, uh, uh, so Banana Man's address is then a type tilde in string. Now, uh, the, 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 the special syntax, one of the bits of special syntax you can use is you can write, if you have a, a generic type with two type parameters, you can write it in fix. So I can write that instead, int tilde string. Uh, and that means that if I want to produce uh, that with a zip code, I can have a tilde of a tilde of something and I can write it int tilde string tilde string. So even though the thing's recursive, the type of it doesn't look recursive and it's quite convenient to write. Another thing I can do is I can pattern match. So I can get things back out of this tilde and pass them into address. Uh, so if I have two fields, I can just uh, write my, uh, write my uh, 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 pattern match like this. But here's the trick. Pattern matching, we can also write infix. So I can write it like this. And that means that if I have three values, I can write it like this. So has anyone used Scala parser combinators? And you've seen this kind of stuff before, right? Because this is the same process. And also a norm. Has anyone used a norm? This, this technique exists in Anorm as well to, to produce parsers for result sets. So we have a, a pretty simple scholarly kind of syntax there. It's pattern matching. It's, you know, uh, we use tildes everywhere else. We might as well use them here. Um, and we can use this to generalize our AND method. So let's see how we're going to do that. Suppose we have two rules, both of which start with the type A. One of them returns a B and one of them returns a C. So we're, we're validating an address. We're producing a, an integer and a string. What we want to do is uh, combine them together with a uh, tilde dot apply, our constructor, to produce um, a value b tilde c. Right? So tilde of b and c. If we have that single object, we can then map over uh, that result and produce an address. Um, we can generalize that to three things by tildering two rules together tildering that with a third rule and getting out a nested data structure that's a triple tilde of, ah, oh, I'm saying tilde too much, but getting back a, a recursive data structure on the right there that we can then dissect with pattern matching. So let's just, just quickly run through the definition. You'll notice that this is basically what we were doing with and, but we've just fixed the constructor. It's always going to be tilde. It's not going to be address or something else. So we'll start with the code for and, and we can get rid of this function that uh, combines A and B into a C because we know what type we're going to produce. I rename, I rename the uh, method to tilde, so we can tilde two results together. Uh, it will return a result of the tildering of the two values, and uh, that gives us the, the generalized combination we need. So now we can write read address like this. We, uh, we get the house number, we get the street name, we get the zip code, we validate all of these things, we get back three results, and then we do this little sort of, sort of dance with the types at the ends to get that into an address. And if we were using the applicative builder model, say, from Scala Z, uh, the code would look more or less like this, except we'd be using TIE fighters instead of tildes, and we'd be able to use a function that didn't have a pattern match. It would just have three arguments on it. So it's worth looking at that stuff. If you, if you're, if you haven't, uh, you want to see applicative builders in Scala Z, learn you a Scala Z. It's a great website. Um, for, for, for checking this stuff out, um, and, and it's basically the same pattern. Okay, so that's pretty much the end of, of the content here. Uh, we can validate uh, any number of rules over an arbitrarily complicated data structure. We can combine the rules in parallel. We can combine them in sequence. We can throw away errors. We can keep errors. Uh, we can do all of this stuff. We have to do some strange pattern matching stuff there, but that's just because... We want to have a very simple library to write. We don't have to write lots of duplicated code. So in summary, uh, I think this is, the, this is the, 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 the fundamentals of library design in what I would call a functional style. It's just about finding these building blocks, finding the right building blocks, rules and results. There's, there's nothing more minimal than that. And then 
writing the right combinators to produce the behaviors we want. So in the case of, we've seen a bunch of uh, different combinators uh, for uh, validation. We've seen two sequencing combinators. We've seen uh, at least two parallel combination operators and an tilde, and there are various other forms of these things. Um, and so we now have an arbitrarily, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we can scale this up as far as we want. Um, I didn't talk about that lifting stuff. Uh, just to give you the punchline on that, the idea is to any, any, any um, combinator we've defined on results, we can produce a variant of it that directly combines rules. So if I, if I can get two, two rules, get out the results, uh, and then combine them with a tilde, I can just tilde the two rules directly. I just write a little method that plugs that gap. So if we do that, we don't have to define uh, little anonymous functions for all of our rules. We can just directly say, OK, read number is get field, then parse in. Read street is get field. Read address is read number and read street. Uh, and then map them together to produce a simple thing, single thing. And we could go through that, but I, I don't think we need to. Everything's uh, on this website. Uh, so you just uh, check it out of uh, GitHub. Check out the code. There's lots of stuff to work through there. And uh, um, that's all I have. Thank you very much. <laughs> and does anyone have any questions? Moment. We need to get it on tape. <laughs> Thank you. Did you ever have a business requirement to direct a particular error message to a particular field on the user interface? Yes, okay, and that's a more subtle problem. So um, that's not something that I could fit into a talk. So I, I originally wanted to tackle that actually, and then I, I dropped it out. So I actually have a little toy validation library. If you go to github.com slash dogonel slash validation, I've got a little library that uses macros to, you, you say, I want to validate you know, uh, this field, so underscore dot number for address dot number, and it will take out the name of the field, reify that to a string, and annotate your results with that field name. And you can recursively subdivide things and, and do that. But you know, that's not a, that's not a beginner, level, beginner level thing, but it's quite a, it's quite a simple implementation if you're into, into your macros. It's about you know, this long. Three lines long, so so uh, check it out. Oh, cool, thanks. Anyone else? Uh oh. <laughs> ah, yes, at the front here. Okay. Oh, wait for the mic. Thank you. Yeah, now I was thinking about uh, creating my own uh, combinators, but now uh, uh, looking at Scalazy, do you think that's uh, a good idea to start with, or? Um, using something like Scala Z, uh, you will get interoperability between the things you're designing and other things. So you would, you would do something like define a, a monad instance for a result, define a, a, well, you wouldn't even need to define result because you'd use, you'd use the disjunction type or validations or something. Uh, but you could define your own monad instance, define your own applicative instance, and then you know, all the rest of the Scala Z infrastructure will work with what you're doing. Uh, if you are happy to just write it yourself and keep it a small project, then I think that's, I think it's certainly appropriate if it's a, a teaching tool. So, yeah. Great, thanks. And one more at the back. I don't recall right now, but in play, the validators have the 22 field limit, I think. So do you know what impl what's the implementation they're using? What's the, sorry? In play, the validators, yeah. the formal, I believe they have the 22 field limit. Do you know what is the implementation they're using for the, for, to combine well, the rules? Well, it'll be based on, there's only 22 types of function, and there's only 22 types of tuple, so yeah, that, that, that'll be the restriction. Now this, um, uh, the, 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 the nested recursive data structure thing is not limited by that, because you're only ever using two fields or anything, but it will be limited if you wanted to produce a nicer syntax so you could directly use a function, you didn't have to, uh, do this, oh, that is, that's it. Do this pattern match, you wanted to have a function of three arguments, you're not going to get any higher than 22 with that because you can't lift a method of more than 22 arguments into a function. So, yeah, I mean, we're, we're stuck with these limitations at least for now. Um, uh, but, yeah. Um, is that, does that answer your question? 
Oh, the question is, what's the implementation play has? Okay. Uh, the implementation play has is, uh, so say like a JSON reader, which is a bit like a validator, it's the same, same stuff. You will provide a JSON reader for every field you want to read, and then you will tilde them all together. That stuff is pretty much what we've shown. It's recursively combining them. And then at the end, you map it through a function, a, a, a raw, like, normal function. That's the limitation. Um, I don't know if they provide a direct way of you taking that as a single value uh, and, like, uh, uh, and then being able to dissect that yourself. But the limitation is that it relies on function literals. At least that's the limitation I'm aware of. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, and anyone else? Not function literals, function values, sorry. Yep. Troublesome character in the blue shirt. Two questions. Uh, first question, in um, Scala Z, the equivalence of this would be uh, disjunction and validation. And maybe you can talk a little bit about why they are separate types in Scala Z. So validation you can't use as a monad, but um, disjunction is a monad, but not applicative. Not uh, OK, clear. so uh, you probably can already answer this question. Uh, I, 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 as I understand it, uh, you can derive, is it derive a monad for each applicative? Um, it's a good thing to clarify. So, so the, the rules in Scala Z are designed to be consistent, whereas the, 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 the way we're combining results in parallel here, with the sort of the applicative style behavior of maintaining error messages, doesn't, isn't, if you derived a monad from that, is it that way around? Applicative from monad. Applicative from monad, sorry. If you derived the applicative from the monad, you would get an applicative that drops error messages. So you'd have two different types of behavior. So the way Scala Z distinguishes it is it says, if you want fail fast error handling, use disjunction. If you want to accumulate error messages, use validation, so you'd swap between the types as you needed. Okay. Second question, in um, I think a sprint two, you made it web scale. Could you also make your validation reactive? <laughs> uh, yes, I, I have not got a method yet to abstract across the, uh, the monad uh, returned by the validations, but uh, yes, we could, we could possibly do that. Free monads, something like that, I don't know. <laughs> Any more questions? Ah, Miles. So, that was an H list. Come on. Uh, it's not. It's not. Not, not that, nil that, terminated. That. Sorry. It's not nil terminated. Well. I mean, it's H listy, right? Yes. Very. It's a, it's a very simple definition. So you your case, get rid, you could probably get rid of most of shapeless, right? You just need oh, that. Oh, totally. That that that, <laughs> that 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 is that is that is basically an H list. Um, yeah, is it, uh, the, 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 the syntax of the pattern matching I didn't know about. Well, I kind of, you know, I, I knew about that stuff before I did this, but I'd never really put two and two together. That you can just, you can design your own types and have these infix notations. It's quite elegant. I like it. And then I realised what everyone else has been doing for, <laughs> for all these years. Uh, any more? Any more? For any more? Okay. Three, two, one. Thank, thank you all very much.